I'm so honoured and excited to be able to be the person who introduces Dr. Judith Landau. Um, we met about um, probably just under two years ago, and um, during that time, um, I've learned so much from Judith on a professional level and on a personal level, and I've been lucky enough to be involved in some of the Arise trainings, um, and I, I, I can just testify to the incredible work that Judith does and the incredible commitment that Judith has to all of the all of the great work that she, that she does all around the world. So um, I'm I'm absolutely honoured and privileged to be able to introduce Dr. Judith talking about a subject that is n it's not it's not the easiest subject. It's not the most um, it's not the most accepted way of treating addiction and and the the aftercare and I'm a living testament to that I'm 13 years sober and I could still be a newcomer because um you know it it, it getting sober in a treatment center and working a brilliant 12 step program doesn't necessarily deal with with the other the other stuff that has happened in my history and in my family's history um and that's just me a normal person so I, ca I cannot comprehend what it would be like for victims of mass disasters um, and so today we've got a very very humanitarian angle from one of the most wonderful human beings that I know so it's my absolute privilege to introduce you to Dr. Judith Landau. Thank you I think I should go home quickly while I'm ahead um, as Matt says, um, prevention and working with communities isn't the most popular or the flashiest thing we do. And I thought it might be helpful if I just say a little bit about how I got to do it. But before I do, I think some of what I want to share with you will, will have you understand why I'm so passionate about not just helping individuals, but really getting out front of what's happening in order to prevent more of the horrors that we're seeing today. We're facing growing global concerns that all of us are aware of. Um, I had trouble looking at these recent statistics. You know, if we think about um, our own circle and how many of our friends were losing how many of our clients and patients and then look at the world statistics we're not alone wherever we are um, here the rate of deaths is increasing dramatically and mainly heroin and morphine but people are saying we're still protected from the pandemic um, in the U.S., our death rate is mounting, our costs are mounting, and one of the things that's most chilling is that we are losing a whole generation of youth. Um, I saw a 16-year-old recently in my office who had attempted suicide because he had buried five of his classmates in that year and thought he would rather take control of his own death. Um, we're also experiencing mass trauma everywhere. We have changing technology. We're in a rapidly changing world. Um, digital technology and social media dominate personal relationships, family and social interaction, daily habits, and even primary thinking processes. We've been told that if our cell phone is in the same room as we are, research is showing that part of our brain is occupied with the cell phone, even if we're not thinking of it or aware of it, and that that's distracting us and reducing our capacity to do whatever it is we want to focus on. Um, I was working with a colleague doing a business consultation a little, a few years back, five years ago, and he had been consulting to the developers of the social media, and their goal five years ago was that within 10 years, 
children and adolescents would be communicating more with their social media than with their families. And I think we're about there. Um, using social media websites is among the most common activity of children and adolescents. Not playing out in the backyard, not building a fort. Is it easier for you to read this, I think? Um, so we're looking at where we are in America And what I'm seeing, um, some of you have heard this, so forgive the repetition, but I've been seeing, I'm a, a child, adolescent and family neuropsychiatrist by training, and I've been seeing children between the ages of 8 and 11 who are severely violent when, they're, when their digital controls are removed. Had one little boy who had done over $40,000 of damage to the home and attacked his mother. He was bigger than she was. And this little 10-year-old had his mother locked in her bedroom because she was so frightened of him. And what had happened when I started to work with the family, I um, asked, this, asked this little guy to sit with me and show me what was on his television. And of 47 movies, only two were suitable for children. The others were all extreme violence. I said, show me your favorite clip, just five or 10 minutes. And I sat with him and watched two avatars really violently attacking each other. And when the winning avatar had won and we switched off the TV, he got into the winning posture and attacked his mother. And when I explored the, the history going back, he had been desperate about sugars and sweet cereals and candies and things from very early on. Once um, they started cutting back on that, he started with video games. And when they took the digital controls away, not only did he go to the medicine cupboard to drink cough mixture, but he, he became extremely violent. So. And he's just one of many. Um, so we're not just looking at the deaths of adolescents from opiates. We're looking at the precursors in little kids with two-parent families and people living in food deserts who appease their children with candies and sugars and, and we're off to the races. So you know, I think we really have to cast a much wider net. Um, no, they can go either way. <laughs> the link between childhood TV violence viewing and aggressive behavior goes on into adulthood. And children who spent excessive amounts of time playing violent video games showed much greater propensity towards aggressive behavior, poorer grades in school, and difficult relationships with their parents. We're looking at climate change, climate refugees. You know, with the Earth's climate changing at an unprecedented rate, the UN estimates there'll be 200 million displaced by climate change by the year 2050. And it could create the world's biggest refugee crisis ever. So, you know, we're looking at things happening all over and I'm assuming that, like me, a number of people in this group are in recovery. Um, we didn't start in our 40s and 50s. We didn't start because we thought alcohol tasted good or we really wanted, um, you know, we wanted to um, develop a behavioral compulsion. <laughs> so, um, we're at the highest level of people displacement on record. Um, are you familiar with the Homes and Race Scale, the Individual Stress Scale? Um, the most stressful thing that, in, that humans can go through is untimely death of someone we love. The second is moving house, just regular moving home. How many of you have moved home? 
Okay. Do you remember the stress? <laughs> so imagine not just moving home, but not having a home to go to. Um, and over half of those refugees are under 18, and there are 10 million stateless people who've been denied a nationality and basic rights. And 20 people are forcibly displaced every minute because of conflict or persecution. Um, we know that addiction, first, first break of mental illness, recurrences of mental illness, relapses in addiction, are all related to trauma. So when we look at this, it's not a surprise to know that refugee populations and even immigrant populations have a minimum of a 30% increase in addiction rates, right? So what are we looking at? So we're really looking at the perfect storm all of these factors threaten the fabric of families and the individual biopsychosocial life of, of each individual. Families are the key unit of health and healing in all communities. And if families are at risk, communities are at risk. Um, just, um, and I'm sorry about doing this up front, but I think, um, and I'm, I know I'm pre preaching to the converted, but I think we need to have a sense of what we're dealing with if we're really going to bring about a change. Um, I'm giving you some of these statistics only to show how directly trauma impacts our, our um, population. Um, prior to the Holocaust, there was a very low prevalence rate of addiction in Jews. Since then, the rates approximate population averages. Um, Vietnam War is being replicated right now with the war on terror. Um, we had 62,000 veterans died of addiction and suicide after the conflict than were killed during the conflict, and the figures for the war on terror internationally are mounting the same way. We're seeing far more people dying of addiction and the consequences of post-traumatic stress and war than die during the conflict. Um, the same thing with Kosovo. Um, the Kosovars are, are a secular Muslim community that didn't drink prior to the war. And um, after the war, um, a year after the war, there was a 30% rate of addiction. And five years after the war, the adult male population was over 90% addiction rate because of the unemployment, and every, everyone had been a refugee. Um, for every person directly impacted by the Oklahoma City bombing, 10 years later, five showed symptoms of stress or PTSD, and those figures have been replicated with a lot of um, mass disasters. Um, United States, 9-11, there was nearly a 30% increase in substance abuse within the first year. But all the things that go along with trauma, um, increased use of cigarettes, alcohol and marijuana, but also a 32% increase in cardiac arrhythmias and lung disease. Um, and what we're seeing now is increased rates of PTSD, traumatic brain injury, mild traumatic brain injury, depression, suicidality, amputation, substance abuse, and a tremendous increase in pain reliever prescriptions, which is one of the things that we're really worried about. Um, and again, I'm not going to go read all of these, but we get an increase in depression, suicide, substance abuse, and, you know, with... Um, geological change, we're looking at increasing, increasing problems all over the world. Not to mention the epidemics and pandemics that are increasing. And finally, we have our random traumatic events that are also increasing. And as we, as we have a, you know, a steadily increasing 
um, level of violence in our youth, most of the random, unpredictable, traumatic acts are in that population that's most at risk. Um, and what's really interesting is that random, unpredictable acts of violence are more terrifying and have greater immediate and long-term impact than violence in a community that's organized and living in a constant state of preparedness or war. So um, that's a huge threat currently. Or am I going the wrong way? So what do we need to do? Um, you know, I, I always struggle because there's an excitement in doing an intervention, helping somebody immediately, getting them into treatment, treating them in treatment. Um, but we're looking at the tip of the iceberg because less than 3% of people with addiction needing treatment get it anywhere in the world. So what we need to be doing is looking at how do we, how do we widen that funnel at the front end so that we can get, so that we can do the preventive work and also the early recognition rather than waiting until people are already so desperate that they have to be admitted when much of the world does not have access to sophisticated treatment. Um, so we really need to look at how do, we, how do we help families and communities access their resilience. Um, I see the family as the integral unit of the community and as such, not only family resilience but also community resilience is dependent upon the health and resilience of the individuals and families in the community. Family and community resilience can be seen as the group's capacity, hope and faith to withstand major trauma and loss, overcome adversity and to prevail usually with increased resources, competence, and connectedness. So how do we mobilize individuals, families, and communities? Um, we need to enhance positive connectedness. Um, we need interventions that draw on the family's inherent resilience rather than labeling behavior and communication patterns as dysfunctional leading to continued vulnerability and risk-taking. How many of you are therapists? Okay. Um, interventionists, educators, um, social services, um, public health, um, who have I left out? Teachers, educators? Hmm? Psychologists, psychiatrists, mental health providers. Yeah, I left myself out. <laughs> that was really cool. <laughs> so we're, you know, we're typically used to being on the on the receiving end, and I'm putting in a plea for us also to be looking at that larger front end. Um, how many of you, when you're when you're working with people, find that they're coming to you? telling you how good they feel about themselves and how competent they know they are. <laughs> right? Yeah. Keep wishing. But we can get there. We really can. So um, I'm going to share um, some of transitional family therapy that's evidence-based best practice, um, really only so that I can share some of the some of the factors that have been found to work, both at the front end and at accessing resilience. And it's based on the philosophy of Ubuntu. Um, anyone, anyone not familiar with Ubuntu? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I grew up in, in um, between, between South Africa and, and the UK. And I grew up in an extended community where the philosophy of Ubuntu is, um, is very prevalent in indigenous communities, 
traditional extended families, communities where rather than an individualistic way of looking at survival and caring and support, we're aware that I am because you are. We are as our community because we're together. Um, if anyone in that extended community is ill, everything is put aside by everybody to take care of that. As opposed to where we are in a lot of the Western world in nuclear families without the extended family support. And if people are not embedded in their neighborhood and are sharing support and help or have extended family available, when trouble strikes, they tend to get more and more isolated and whatever illness they have, whether it's mental illness, addiction, or a chronic, chronic physical illness, they're a whole lot worse because they don't have that emotional and physical support. And um, I grew up during, during the days of apartheid, well, before and during and before, I was used to having my family's friends were all um, multiple ethnicities and cultures, and um, and I also spent a lot of time in um, in the um, in the Corsa, Zulu and um, ta um, uh, um, rural areas, tribal areas, and also with the with the East Indians who lived around us, and. When apartheid came, all of the mixed marriages suddenly became illegal. People who had been close friends of, you know, of our families were no longer allowed to be seen together. And whenever I was with friends who, were, who didn't happen to look like I did, um, we would find ourselves in a police station or somewhere worse. Um, what was incredible about it was with all the horror of um, people disappearing in the night and you know the, the sound of one's door being battered down as the secret police raced in to look for contraband literature or hidden people. Through all of that, I knew that my close friendship circle that was more of a family, which it is in a, in a collective, in a structure where there is Ubuntu, when one person, one, you know, one family's parents were missing because they were taken away, we always knew that there was this larger system of support. We never felt alone. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the things that, that I try to do in, in my work is take away that sense of aloneness. We don't reach out. Um, how many of you reach out the minute you're not feeling good? You know, very few. Yeah, you know, we're trained to close in and cope, you know. Um, so I became aware that no matter how bad things were, if we remain connected, we're able to cope with almost anything. And when we meet with refugees, with um, people who have been isolated in their addiction or in their mental illness. That sense of aloneness is one of the most important long-term destructive um, emotions. Um, so what we need to do is we need to build on the intrinsic resilience, strengths and resources of individual, family, and extended natural support system to solve their own problems, give, to give them the tools so that we're not needed in the long term because there's no way we can alone as professionals cope with the vast, um, the vast problem facing us. We need to draw on members of the support, natural support system to form a network committed to helping the immediate family with its problems. and. Um, one of the things that I've learned is that we can coach members of the natural support system 
as family and community links who can extend resources so that situations with insufficient or, un, you know, or not um, insufficient professional services can be effective. Um, I had a couple of experiences while I was a medical student. Um, one of them was I was asked to, you know, we were, um, as medical students, we had to take the history of the patients and take their bloods and blood pressure and so on and then do a report. And I was sent in to Clark, this young man, he was about 27, and I walked in, he was um, closer, walked in behind, in those days it was long wards with 15 beds on either side and curtains, um, opened the curtains and I stepped back out again. Um, there was a young man who had one arm missing, amputated, the other one um, cut just below the elbow and um, he had only one leg. He'd been smoking and drinking all his life and he'd had peripheral um, arterial disease and had had to have amputations because of gangrene and he had been told that he needed to have his leg his other leg amputated or he'd die and he had he wanted to die he did not want to live like that he had a little band around his arm that held a beer can and a little one that held a cigarette and or a marijuana um, toke I asked whether he had any family, no, anybody I could talk to, no, just let me die. Worked with a social worker who found his brother. The story was that he had been a crook, he'd stolen, he'd, you know, he'd been in and out of jail with his addictions, and he had been thrown out of the tribe. And he had nowhere to go. And I asked the brother, to go back to the tribe and speak to the chief and the chief's council for advice because they tried him on antidepressants, you know, the gangrene was going up his leg. This was an emergency. The brother came back from the tribe and spoke to him and he said, the chief says that if you promise never to steal again, never to smoke again, never to drink again, and to have the surgery, you can come home. He went home after his surgery and he became one of the most famous storytellers and mentors of young people in the tribe. You know, I couldn't have done that. And the lesson for me was finding people who have those connections so that we work through them to be able to bring about change. And if you think about um, how many of you are interventionists, right? You're working through a link. You're working through a family member who calls you. How many of you involve a link when you're doing therapy or doing an assessment? We're using links to help tell us about the story. We're using links to bring about change. Um, So, um, growing up in, in, in Africa with all the multiple languages and religions and um, cultures, I tried very hard to learn them all and realized that I wasn't going to manage. There was a point where, you know, th there's a limit to how many languages anybody can learn. And the variety of religions from the Judeo-Christian Muslim group to um, worship of ancestors and the Bushmen who worship a large deer, um, a large antelope, the elant, and the praying mantis, the little stick, stick insect. So I started to look for what are the universals that we can work through. And the one that I selected was the transition, that we're, every living thing is in transition. And if we look at um, people from the perspective of what happens to all of us as we change, we have something that crosses cultures and, and countries and barriers. So looking at, looking at people from the perspective of transition, 
we look at the here and now and what's happening right now, what, why is it that we are involved with this person at this particular moment? Why is it that they've started using or drinking or had a, a recurrence of a mental illness? What is the intergenerational story? What went on in their history? What went on in the community around them? The themes, the scripts, the stories, and most important, the intergenerational strengths. Think about those refugees. They're the ones who've survived. They're the ones who've brought with them the intergenerational strengths, the cultural strengths that have allowed them to be the survivors. Right? Our families, everyone in this room, comes from a family of survivors. Right? And then the history of the family and their context. When I was teaching in Rochester, um, where the, which was the headquarters of Kodak, um, one of those old companies that's no longer relevant because of the digital advances, um, whenever we'd listen to the news in the morning, and if Kodak laid off workers, we knew there would be an increase in the, in the um, admissions to the emergency room, the addiction clinic, the family clinic, and various other parts of the hospital. Direct relationship, and not only of the people who were let, you know, who had lost their jobs, but their family members who were living with the same stress. So, we believe that families are intrinsically healthy and competent in constant transition and cope well unless there are three or more transitions in a short space of time. And people going through mass disaster average 13 to 16 transitions at the same time. So think about your own family and having, let's say, promotion at work, a new job, I mean, a, um, a new baby, somebody sick, and you've got a shuttle between all of those. And then think about 13 to 16 changes going on at once and all the tasks that come with each of those transitions. Right? And we're able to access and use our strength and resilience unless we're cut off from our natural support systems. So recovery and healing are based on empowering the family community and natural support system, mobilizing and reconnecting the extended support system, reinforcing connection to both family and culture of origin, and focusing not only on individual, but also on family healing and recovery. Um, we know, for example, in addiction, that if people complete treatment, their rate of recovery is enormously improved. If, if they don't complete treatment, their statist outcome statistics are way worse. If we involve their families and not just the individual, the rate of treatment retention is quadrupled and correlates directly with long-term outcome. We do better in systems of support with our families, with our friends, with our families of choice. And one of the things that I've learned is that um, one of our worst enemies is seeing ourselves as different from the people we work with. That we, the dichotomy, you know, we're invulnerable, we have the answers, um, does not help people heal. What helps people heal is a collaborative effort where we bring our expertise on whatever work we're doing, whatever model we're using, and they bring their knowledge and expertise about themselves and their families. And in that partnership, we can bring about long-term recovery. We need to mobilize the extended natural support system. And whatever the problem is, eliminating blame, shame, and guilt is critical. Um, anyone in the room who's never felt ashamed, blamed, or guilty you know, we, we still carry that little child inside of us that did something wrong and felt terrible. You know, I don't care how old and ugly we get, 
we still have that, you know, that, that sense of vulnerability. And when we're feeling that way, do you feel filled with confidence and the capacity to change the world? No, we curl up into ourselves. So if we don't find a way of helping with blame, shame, and guilt, we're not bringing out that empowerment and competence that allows people to act. Um, resolve unresolved grief and loss, which we know are a huge factor in both addiction and mental illness, and also in physical illness. When um, family members are living with, with unresolved grief, they become ill. And that's physical illness as well as depression. We need to focus on individual and family healing, find the resources, and then look at patterns across the generation. Um, one of the things that, that I found really useful is thinking about us moving along a hypothetical transitional pathway that takes us from some that takes us from the past where we bring despair. And this is usually where we meet people if we're in the helping professions. Um, when we're stuck in despair, we often can't identify where it comes from, what it's about. Once we start looking at where really exploring the past, understanding how we got to the current situation, in the present, it brings enormous relief. And when we're relieved, we have the capacity to plan the future, to choose the strengths from the past and not repeat the vulnerable patterns. And that, in turn, brings hope. And without hope, we never get action for healing. These are all the things that I know you all know, so I'm not going to bore you by reading them. Um, but the one that is probably of all of these the most key is resolving secrets. And for some reason, our survival also is linked not just to hope, but to the knowledge that there will be a, con a continuum of our family values, mission, and heritage. That we're not just isolated at this moment in time, but that there is that continuum that makes it worth going on. So when we're looking for our natural change agents to serve as family or community links, um, let me give you a, another example. Um, I was working with a young man who was severely suicidal and um, he had um, another young man who was suicidal. Maybe we should give, I'm gonna do a different example. Um, I was working with a group of, of um, Presbyterian ministers who were learning how to do couples counseling and work with people in their, um, in their um, community, in their congregation. And I asked them to either write or draw genogram, which is the family professional's way of depicting family tree. And I was really surprised because most of them could only do two generations. And this was a group of African Presbyterian ministers. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I grew up at the feet of the storyteller and listening to the elders talk about, you know, about the, 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 um, fam you know, the stories. So why were these men just looking at two generations. They had been, they had grown up in the city, away from all of their stories. Um, parents were responsible for discipline and they were not around the elders and the storytellers who would tell them the history of the tribe and their families. They were going into a community to work with families with no understanding of any of their own past. Um, I sent them back to find, to find out their stories and they came back with a very different view. And um, knowing our story 
makes an enormous difference to how we view the world and how we connect with others. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the things when, when the links are able to know their stories, they can honor their own traditions, rules and rituals and maintain their community's tradition, pride and privacy. They can draw on group resilience while respecting their capacity for healthy change and survival. And they don't invite us to become long-term part of their family and community. And we don't belong in anyone else's family long-term. And if we try to solve all their problems for them, what's going to happen when we leave, right? We can't be there long term. We shouldn't. We shouldn't be moving into their families. So working through people who belong and who can then be coached and learn to have everybody improve allows them long term survival. Um, what it means is that we have to remember our own, our own humility, that we don't have all the answers, that we're in a partnership and that they need to be the ones taking credit for change so that they have the energy to go on with healing. They're empowered by coaching to draw on love, respect and hope of their own family and community, not from us. They keep their pride and privacy and they act as a bridge between us and families and communities particularly closed families where outside interventions neither invited nor welcomed. For example, highly educated, sophisticated groups, people growing up in the spotlight, um, and also traditional extended families who will come for treatment in an acute crisis, and as soon as the crisis is over, you won't see them again. Right? So, Finding links and coaching them allows the healing to continue instead of being erratic and it's a revolving door. So we're embedding people in that family and community who will sustain change and healing. Any of you had the experience where you see somebody once and they don't come back until there's another crisis, right? So this is a way of dealing with that very differently. Um, sorry. So how do we select them? They have to be able to communicate with all the levels of the community. They have to be respected and trusted by members at every level. And I'm talking about community in a generic sense. This can be a community that is an entire province or country. It can be a community that's a work community. It can be a school, um, a church. Think about community as whatever that particular um, organized body of people is. Okay. Um, respected and trusted by members at every level. Um, this sounds really easy, but it's, it's not. Because one of the things that I learned working in communities is, and in families, there's always that one person who says, me, me, I'm the person everybody loves. They all talk to me. Use me. And that's often the person with the least leverage and the one who people don't talk to because they know they've got a big mouth or they're not, you know, <laughs> all they want is to feel good about themselves, right? Um, They need to be flexible and unbiased. In other words, if, um, you know, if there is a decision to be made and there are two camps around the decision, you want somebody who understands both, both options and can essentially be a mediator and understand both and talk reasonably to both and not be locked into one or other coalition. Um, they have to be effective without engendering resentment or opposition, not allied with a coalition. And the links can serve at the community level, 
They can serve through groups um, for individuals and families of any ages. And belonging in the natural support system removes bias and provides long-term sustainability. So I'm going to share, um, you know, based on transitional family therapy, there are a number of um, evidence-based best practice protocols. Do you all know what, what that means? Um, an evidence-based best protocol is one that has, um, has been researched in clinical trial with measured against a, another, treat, another treatment or model that is accepted or treatment as usual, or it can be several models that are tested against each other. Um, they have to be manualized. There has to be a manual so that anybody who's trained can follow the manual and get the same results that, that were, that were um, found in the original trial. And finally, they have to be able to be repeated in elsewhere with the same results, okay? So um, this is one, one of those, and it's, um, it functions at community and family level. Um, so I'm just going to, um, actually I'm gonna give you an example before we go into this. So, I got called into, um, trying to think how best to do this. The first time I did this was I got called as a psychiatrist to come to a school where there had been multiple suicides and um, a lot of kids were acting out and there were tremendous problems. And I didn't know what to do. So I invited the teachers, the parents, and, and the neighborhood, the um, elders in the community, the town council, the, the spiritual leaders, the sports coaches, and said, let's all get together and try and find a way, find out what's going on, why is this happening, and what can we all do about it? Okay? And I learned a great deal and then started looking at how do we do this effectively? So the process that, that came out of that, and based on looking at the transitions, the strengths of the community, the strengths of the family, the history, the things we've just been talking about. Um, so we bring the whole community together, and I'll tell you how we do that in a minute. It's a three-stage process that empowers the community and allows us to leave. First, we bring everybody together to share their history, traditions, and their current situation. Typically, a traumatic event, a mass disaster, an increase in addiction or HIV, AIDS, whatever the, the issue is. We work with them to select community links, like the, the natural helpers we've been talking about who lead them to establish clear goals and then turn those into small workable tasks with committed work groups. And then the community takes over the process when the outside professionals withdraw and they take credit for change. We use all sorts of maps, genograms, geographic maps, cultural maps. We look at the spirituality and religion of the group. Um, I'll do a, share a transitional field map with you in a minute. We do timelines. What's the history? What has been good in this community? What has been challenging? And the history and the stories. And mostly the themes, strengths, and resources. So, um, I got called to I'll give you one of the examples. I got an, um, called because Argentina was having tremendous problems with an increase in 
addiction, inner city violence, domestic violence, and HIV AIDS following the political and economic disaster. Um, what, what could they do? Now, we can't just race into a community and say, hey, you all come, we want to work together. One, one has to approach really carefully. And the elements that need to happen, and this is the same when you're inviting a family. To who, how, how many of you work with families? Right? You go through a very careful process to find out how to enter a family, who you need to be working with. Um, who consults to organizations or same thing, right? One has to go very gently in terms of how one enters and who one's going to collaborate with. So what we found was we have to get, first of all, one needs to have the knowledge about what's happening in that community, the authority to enter a mission and identify the change makers who will then need to permeate the entire system. We need to establish motivation, support, invitation, and permission. And find out where the special skills and leadership are and the contexts and the neighborhoods. And one can spin this pyramid any way. If we think about, for example, if you're coming in by invitation of, um, when I went to Argentina, the invitation came from an organization called Padre a Padre, Parent to Parent, um, the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education. But they had their own, their own particular agendas, right? So then, so if they were the ones inviting, then it was a question of how to reach all the other levels of the community. Sometimes the invitation comes from community leaders, from I've, um, one school I worked in, the invitation came from some of the children. So if you think about that on a, you know, on a hierarchy, they were down here. One, one can't come in here and do effective work without involving people at every level. Okay. Stop me if there are questions, or we can talk afterwards. Um, so we do a transitional field map where we're looking at every level of the system, the individuals, biopsychological, psychosocial, their family and intimate relational support system, the extended natural support system or networks, those people with whom they're in contact on a regular daily basis when things are going well, the ancillary or artificial support system, which is where we belong when we're working as therapists or doctors or um, seeing people when there's a problem. The primary care provider would be in the natural support system, the specialty hospital would be in here. And we're all embedded in our cultural and evolutionary ecosystems. And we've now got people trotting backwards and forwards beyond. Um, so we need to be thinking about every level. And we use this with families as well, because when we find a family where this level of ancillary or artificial support system has many professionals involved, social services and so on, um, and not family members, we know we're in trouble. Um, it takes five of us, five members of the ancillary or artificial support system to replace one family member. So when you're working with an individual or a family or a community, doing this and having people, you know, I just draw a, a snail on the board, on a, on a flip chart, and let them write in who they have at each level. And that shows you where you need to be focusing on how do you mobilize the people that are going to be needed for healing and health to be sustained over time. So 
So we provide the process and we let the community generate the content and goals that relate to what they want to achieve, not what we think they should achieve. We help them turn the goals into realistic tasks and practical projects building on existing resources. The less the interventionist, the coach, the facilitator does, the more successful the program and community. And we tread lightly, leaving no footprints while the community takes credit for change. That's thanks to, to, my, to our executive vice president. Her company has that philosophy and we adopted it. Thank you, Pam. Um, so when we're thinking about how to help communities, so I'll just go back one step. So what we're doing is in that community, and I'll go into the community meeting a little more if we have time, but in that community meeting, we're breaking them into groups. They're talking about their history. They're identifying where the community's been, what they want to achieve, what their strengths are, what their goals are, and then identifying links who then will set up little work groups to work on those different goals, divide them into workable concrete tasks. And I'll give you an example. Um, some of the things that they do is they hold community meetings. Well, you can read those. Those are just some of, some of what, what typically happens. Um, so Argentina, as I mentioned, we worked across the whole country, but the um, evaluation was of, in Buenos Aires province with a population of 12 million. Um, the focus was on violence, HIV, AIDS, and substance abuse. The links were concerned community members working in collaboration across each level of the community. And the result was a 400% increase in young substance abusers being brought into treatment by their families within two years. Follow up 15 years later, in one city of 2 million people, 37 of 43 community projects were still functioning. And what I loved most was that the mayor, who'd only been in office for five years, took complete credit. And nobody knew that we'd ever been there, which is what we want. And they're now doing the 25-year follow-up. So um, one of the things that's really helpful, sorry, let me go back to my map. Um, one of the things that's really helpful with this map is when you're thinking about who you need to involve in a community, you want to almost take, um, you know, take a slice of the pie. So um, if you think of the pyramid, you want a thin slice of the pie that's representative of every level of the, trans whoops, of the transitional field map and of the, um, and of the pyramid. If you miss out, a, so for example, you want the street sweeper, the school cook, the, pres you know, the um, minister of health and economy, the um, some of the attorneys, some of the, um, the gamblers and the drinkers are in the pub. You want to really get your cross-section. It doesn't have to be huge, but if it's truly representative, you have the leverage to fan out into that community. Um, Kosovo, um, the focus was on improving services and treatment compliance of the chronic mentally ill reducing rates of addiction, developing health and mental health services. So I was there during the war um, to start doing this and um, went with a team and there were only 37 healthcare providers left at the end of the war and they had all been refugees themselves. And it was a cross section. Um, the medical school, well, everything was closed. People were not, the um, Kosovars had not been allowed to be educated or have jobs, which is what happens in every community when there is this kind of war. And um, we had to start from scratch building, you know, they had to build new medical school, nursing school, and all the rest of it. Um, so 
They established regional decentralized home health houses and treatment clinics, mobilized links to reach out to families in every region, ensured collaboration between health, mental health, and the new addiction services, and within a, within a year we had a compliance rate of people with schizophrenia and their families taking medication and attending treatment of 98% because they were not allowed to go to... So the health house was paraprofessionals in every, commu in every community and nobody was allowed to go to a health house. The next level up was a clinic with nurses and social workers and then the hospital. No one was allowed to go without a family member. Um, while I was working in Kosovo, I got a call from New York saying, what, New York and, and Washington saying, what about us? You're working with people in Kosovo, but you're not working with the Kosovars who are refugees here. And so we, we did a, a community resilience um, workshop with them. And um, this is directly from them. This was their list of scripts, themes, strengths, and resources. And it was incredible because they came in with this sense of, the, you know, doom. I mean, they were separated from their families. They'd all lost an enormous number of people and gone through terrible hardship. But they started to, they started to cheer up and begin to be really active and chatting with one another as they visited the good stuff. Um, these were their goals with the basic tasks. And I loved them talking about raising the children's sense of pride because these were, these were kids who, who were not coping at school, feeling really bad about themselves. It was just an amazing list. You know, that, and I think, you know, for me, what's, what's always so humbling is that I couldn't possibly come up with these. You know, it has to come from them. And um, models can't be transposed if they're filled with content. You can carry a process elsewhere, but not the content. The content has to belong to the people who are using it whether it's an intervention, therapy, whatever it is. This was their next, the next of their list. And they decided they wanted to talk about connectedness and strong family values and a sense of unity rather than talking about grief. And they actually celebrated and dealt with their grief with dancing and singing, and some of it was heartbreaking. I mean, I was in floods of tears a lot of the time. I mean, and I'd seen a lot of the horrors that they'd seen um, and that the kids had seen. And I'm not gonna share them because I still have nightmares regularly. Um, and then they decided to get help from the international community. And this is one of the things that the more traumatized people are, the less they reach out for help, whether it's an individual or a community. And every wave of refugees and immigrants feel bad about themselves. They don't feel worthy. They don't feel that they have the leverage or the rights. And often they don't. <laughs> um, and then they started writing. Um, yes, it's an amazing list that's, you know, if we think about how we work in therapy and help people do this, it can be done and a lot at a larger level. Um, we also use this in treatment centers in um, long-term psychiatric facilities where one brings the whole community of the patients and the staff together to look at how they want to improve, where they want to go with things. Um, I'm just sharing, I, um, I was called to New York the day after 
and this was working in lower Manhattan using that transitional field map. You can have these slides, they're all, they're all available. Um, and the public, the, all of this is published and um, I've got cards if you want to go to our website. Um, there, most of the papers of this stuff are downloadable, so they're all there. Um, so this was what the Lower Manhattan community did in a, in a community meeting. You can see how they put their feel, you know, here we've got the biological organisms and their responses and what they were feeling, who there was, what they had to, to rely on, who were, where were their supports, what was the prevailing culture, and it was multiple cultures in Lower Manhattan. Right? So they did this, you know, I mean, obviously I typed it up, but it was written on an enormous, we actually did it on a wall because it needed a lot of space. And then we went through, at, you know, looking at the multi-systemic levels of what was happening from, from the, from the um, transitional field map, taking it down to each level of the systemic level, traumatic, protective factors, symbols and narrative, you know, what's the story, what are the reactions, and how do we intervene and prevent? And this is all done with them, okay? Um, so families are critical for long-term healing. So we've talked about the community as a whole, but the families are our units, right? Um, so one of the things that became a, that, that I thought was, was apparent was that when we know our stories, if we're connected to family and culture, we have an enormous amount of strength and capacity for dealing with trouble and for change. So um, we did a series of studies to test that, and um, one of them was looking at sexual risk-taking. So if my hypothesis was, if we're connected to our, our family of origin and our culture of origin, we would take less risks with ourselves, right? So we used sexual risk-taking that was um, easy to measure, and at that point I was doing a lot of um, AIDS prevention, uh, AIDS and addiction. So we used frequency of contact with extended family to measure contact with family and knowledge of family stories across time for the cultural measure. Um, first study was women in an STD clinic compared with women in a regular social community center. Both measures of frequency of contact and knowledge of stories held up together and separately and both correlated significantly with reduced sexual risk taking. Then we went to a clinic of troubled adolescent girls. Quantitative results were similar, so we analyzed the stories for themes of resilience versus themes of vulnerability. The least risk-taking correlated to themes of resilience. The next lowest correlated to themes of vulnerability. The most risk-taking correlated with knowing no story. We then went back and analyzed the content of the stories and were really surprised because they were often, the vulnerable and resilient stories were often identical. And the difference was the way the kid and the family viewed themselves. You know, I come from a family of survivors. We, we've, you know, we've had, we've been through horrible times, but you know, we can, we, we can do this versus there's no hope. I know that I'm never going to get better. My kids are going to be addicted. We've had so many murders and rapes and, and violence that there's, you know, look at this community. It's never going to change. But the story was the same. And it was the attitude of the individual in the family. Right? So we need to reconnect families and communities by enhancing positive connectedness. Drawing on the family's inherent resilience rather than labeling behavior and communication patterns as dysfunctional because that labeling leads to continued vulnerability and risk-taking 
rather than increased self-esteem, competence, and self-efficacy. And if we think about how, um, how easy it is to slip into language that is blaming or shaming, you know, we don't talk about, there goes Mr. Pneumonia, or, oh, yes, there's fracture. But we talk about addicts. We talk about schizophrenics, right? We don't talk about, um, you know, there's the heart disease. You know, there's Mr. Bypass, right? And we're surprised then that there's shame, blame, and guilt, right? Um, one of the communities I worked with in Brazil, um, and Brazil is, as you probably know, has the greatest Gini, well, did have the greatest um, Gini index, the separation between the very wealthy and the very poor. And in this community, there'd been a great deal of, um, it was a, a city of about, probably about a million and a half people, Porto Alegre. And the, um, th there was an acute crisis in the schools and also in the communities with murder and violence and the rate of addiction was increasing rapidly. And um, I'd broken everybody you know, was with obviously with a large team of, of people trained in community resilience. And I was talking to a little girl in one of the groups and asked her where she lived. And the name of the town that she gave me translated as Mary without a head. This child lived in Mary without a head. And just thinking, and then I got the story from one of the, you know, one of the, one of the elders in the room and, you know, a husband had beheaded his wife for some unknown reason or because he was drunk. But these children identified as living in a, you know, in a town of Mary without a head. And, you know, we, we really, I think we're becoming more and more aware of the power of language as a catalyst for change. Mm -hmm. um, so how can we foster resilience? And these are, all seem really simple, but families who are in distress and communities who are in distress don't do this, right? And as simple as grandparents sharing stories, good, bad, or indifferent, but sharing the stories. Which of you has ever been with a little kid that doesn't want to be read to but wants to hear a family story, right? Often that's what they'll choose help them learn to choose it. I know one of the things that adolescents always say when I say I want you all to get to know, 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 your, know each other's friends and the adolescents go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what can we do? What can educators and consultants do? How many of you meet with your people you work with, um, clients, patients, in their home settings ever? Makes an enormous difference. It allows you to know things that you might never, ever get to hear. Collaborate with families. Don't treat them as lesser than. Know when to refer and when to delegate. Treatment professionals and programs. Communicate, communicate. Um, provide a continuum. And all the things that I know all the treatment centers at this conference do. <laughs> first responders. And I think we often forget about journalists when we're thinking about first responders. And um, I was working with um, community resilience in um, t our, a, a town near me called Aurora, where there was a school shooting, um, and then there were cinema shooting and, and so on. And it's a community, at, at the last community meeting that I went into as a consultant, there were people from 27 countries. It's an area that, you know, that is a, a microcosm of the United States. And um, 
one of the journalists was talking about, um, about the fact that he never is sent to write about something or photograph something that is a celebration. He's constantly only experiencing the horror. You know, we forget that they're first responders. Um, how many of you are CPR certified? Good, I think we all should be. And I strongly encourage everybody to learn how to administer naloxone. It's all about Ubuntu. Thank you. Thanks. We've got a little bit of time for questions or comments if you like, or you're welcome to go have tea, coffee, or whatever gives you pleasure. Yes. Um, let me give you um, a chief. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. There you are. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you. so much. Uh, what is the difference to refer and delegate? Um, one of the things that, um, that I've learned very early was that I never have all the answers. There's always somebody who will know more than I do. Um, I don't refer and delegate with every client, every patient, or every situation. But typically, when I'm doing the initial assessment of what is needed, I will talk to whoever else is involved in dealing with that situation or that person or that family. So that's when I'm collaborating. If, for example, I'm working with somebody who I think might have, um, they've been referred to me for addiction. And I think they might have a head injury or their brain may be damaged. I would refer to a neurologist. I would have a psychological assessment done. Um, one of the challenges in current and modern medicine, and it, particularly in addiction, is that we're seeing a split in the training between mental health and addiction in many parts of the world, rather than seeing it as part of, of, um, you know, of, of one field with subfields. So that people trained in addiction are often not taught how to do an assessment for mental health. Um, somebody in mental, so, so people get angry at each other you know, um, somebody who's working in addiction gets a referral from someone who's been in a, you know, w working with a mental health provider who's missed the addiction. The mental health provider gets furious because somebody's working in addiction and not noticing that there's a serious depression. Um, I had a, a, a woman, sorry, those of you who were with me for the training, I talked about her. I got a woman aged 47 referred to me for, for she, the antidepressants were no longer working. She'd been on, and she was severely obese. She'd been on antidepressants since she was 17. Um, she was severely obese. She, had, she was at the brink of losing her marriage and had a lot of trouble communicating with her, with her grown children. And I sent her to an endocrinologist she had um, severe thyroid disease. Her, um, you know, that was just the tip of the iceberg. She had high, um, high blood pressure and thyroid disease, which she had had for 30 years. We got her off the antidepressants that were making her fat. We got her on treatment for her thyroid disease, and she has been healthy ever since her marriage was saved. If she'd gone in the right door the first time, she wouldn't have had to go through all of that. You know, and we see it a lot. So being aware of our own limitations and never hurts to get a second opinion. It never hurts. You know, we, we shouldn't be taking risks. And um, I see it again and again and again. I had, um, I, I had a, a woman, a magic, um, you know, I had a man referred to me who was in his 50s, um, a global executive, very effective man. And um, 
he had been diagnosed with advanced, um, advanced brain disease from his addiction by the addictionologist who had never referred him for a CAT scan or for, a, or for um, he'd had a very superficial psychological assessment that showed that he wasn't functioning as he should. He had a brain tumor. You know, it just, um, I work collaboratively a great deal. That's my, you know, because of my various specialties. So I see this all the time and I see it with interventionists who get called in because of an addiction and aren't trained in, don't know about the mental illness, don't, under, you know, don't see that this is dual diagnosis or co-occurring conditions. So I think, you know, for me, that's one of the, one of the things that we, we, we have to put away our pride when we're working with people. We have to be open, we have to speak to family members. They'll often tell you, you know, she was depressed for a long time before she started drinking, or she never got over the birth of the baby or the loss of her father, right? Um, we have to be open to hearing from family members who will tell you things that the patients won't. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a very long answer. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> you, you got me on my bandbox preaching to the, to the choir. <laughs> yes. Sorry, let me pass this. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I, so I work mainly in with um, immigrant populations and often first generation immigrant populations. Mm -hmm. um, and I, 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 I'm just curious to know what you would recommend for populations that don't act, ha, don't speak the native language and maybe are forced into communities that they don't necessarily feel is a genuine fit for them just because they share that mm -hmm. language? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a very common issue. Um, <clears throat> I was um, involved when the, the Hmong arrived in Philadelphia. I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania. And they were really isolated. They, they had been isolated and... Um, were very poorly thought of back home. They were at the bottom of the pecking order. So they weren't, they weren't people who had learned to advocate for themselves at all. And we set up meetings with the, um, we actually met with social services and had them go out to homes in the neighborhood where, where the Hmong were living and invite them to a community meeting and to share their stories of immigration, which many of them were a generation or two back, and how their families had adapted. And we had some of them offered to adopt a family. Um, we've done the same thing, for example, with after 9-11, I was living in Boulder, Colorado, and the Muslim kids were scared to go to school. And we held a, a town meeting, and the families the, the parents decided that each um, that each of their ki each of their non-Muslim kids would adopt a Muslim kid and go to school with them and have lunch with them, and they got integrated very quickly. And but we had to we had to work really hard to get admission to those Muslim homes. They were terrified of letting us in, but so were the Bhutanese refugees, because they were expecting if there was a problem they were the latest immigrants and they'd be in trouble. You know, so it's really important to make sure that people get embedded in community. You know, in the same way, if you're pirating in with a new treatment center, um, we've, you know, we always go and visit the families, the ministers, everybody in that community to talk about it. Open your doors, offer an educational meeting once a week, you know, helping build those bridges and, and embedding people and connecting them in that community makes an enormous difference. Yeah. Yes. And <laughs> please, if you have to go, I won't be offended. Thank you. Not a question, just a comment that I'm so grateful that I can be here. I came all the way from Hungary. <laughs> and... Uh, 
you are truly inspiring. So thank you. Thank you. And um, our colleague knows I've worked in Hungary many years ago for a long time, um, helping develop family therapy, addiction counseling, and acupuncture detox because we didn't want methadone. Right. So there's some amazing people working in this field in Hungary. Hi. Um, Hi. I, I just wanted to ask you if you've had any experience at all with long-term, almost permanent refugees. There's, um, I'm going to be up in Kenya next month, mm -hmm. and, and, and there's um, a couple of big camps in the north which are basically becoming mm -hmm. essentially permanent. small cities. They're permanent cities. And, and the increase in sort of depression, suicide, and, and uh, problems is, yeah. is, is really spiraling right now. Mm -hmm. Have you ever worked in that kind of community before? Um, I have, only, only once um, when during the, uh, d well, up, during and then after for quite a period, the, after the Bosnian war, um, what had happened was the Bosnians fleeing into Hungary thought they were Hungarian because they, you know, they were ethnic Hungarian, but they'd left 300 years before, and they no longer s they spoke a dialect. They were not accepted. And um, the, the towns around the refugee camps, they had, you know, put up huge barriers, and they weren't allowed in at all. They were completely kept in on their own. Um, we were able, I think partly because of the surrounding economy, which it, it was not good, and there was a real threat to the locals that if the refugees came out, they would first of all tell bad stories to the children, they would steal their jobs, I mean, it was tremendous fear of the refugees. We were able to mobilize leadership and community members to slowly start bringing people out. But the situation in Kenya is different. There really is almost nowhere for them to go. And, um, you know, something at that level has to be done at the government level where families and small communities need to be moved together to places that are viable. And um, that's where one really has to bring in, you know, sectors. I would bring in, um, are you work who are you working through? Uh, so I'm going with UNHCR, and I'm having a look yeah. at yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, you know they have some leverage, and then um, I've 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 heard about. I'm not crazy about some of the work that's done, because they, you know, I think one of the things that doesn't work is trying to do it on a mass scale, and when you've got a situation like that with nowhere to go, you have to break it down into small workable tasks and do pieces of it at a time, you know, and clearly having them, you either decide you're going to have a permanent city and start building resources in it, or you move people out in workable groups to situations that are viable. Good Thank luck. Thanks. Love to hear from you yes. about been, you know, how it goes and what happens. Thank you. Okay. Somebody got a hand up or? Thank you. Yes, I'm a pediatrician and addiction physician in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, in good. The US. I was born I'm, in Rochester, by the way. <laughs> and I spend a lot of time in Nashville. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> well, you know, it's a very ethnically diverse area in Antioch, which is south of Nashville. Yes. Very diverse. Yes. Um, I'm starting to find that my population of addiction was about 90% Caucasian okay, that live in Tennessee, mm -hmm. but because of that diverse area, I'm starting to see a trickle of the Kurdish and the Iraqi men are starting wow. to come in for their opiate addiction. But now, which is unbelievable, a few women are actually coming in. From the Iraqi group or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. For their addiction. Yeah. And I'm finding it like, how do I... Because sometimes they're coming with a family member, but most of the time their husband is there. And they can't talk. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm trying to ask. Yes, and it's they, not like some of them speak English, some of them don't. Right. So, but so I would try to work with an interpreter, mm -hmm. um, get the husband's permission to talk about women's things. 
the, um, the, the men don't usually, in, in that culture, don't usually want to hear about women's stuff. And, and you can say, you know, women's problems, um, anything that'll, you know, get you permission to have. And then I would ask, are there any other women in the family that they'd like to bring with them who may speak the language? Or if there's um, an, a, you know, an, an official interpreter where they can talk privately. But I find with, with those two cultures, it's really important to, to separate genders and to start with, you know, to first of all really work with the men so that they're comfortable giving you permission to get into their family and then with the women and then you can bring them together. Yeah. Thank you. And the fact that you're trusted enough that the women are coming is a tremendous tribute to you. Well done, really. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Oh, sorry, one more. Last one. I just wanted to say thank you, because I'm here as a nutritionist with Great. a background in mental health issues and addiction. And um, just what you were saying earlier about the woman with the thyroid, I have yes. a lot of um, clients that come to see me mm -hmm. with autoimmune situations, mm -hmm. with underlying um, eating disorders right. and mental health right. issues, and, con and very quickly need mm -hmm. to kind of pass them on to yeah. neuroendocrinologists mm -hmm. or um, endocrinologists yeah. and, and addiction specialists. Mm -hmm. um, and it's wonderful to hear that you do that. Obesity particularly is one of the classic poster children for collaboration because you know there are nutritionists who don't pick up on that and work with diet <laughs> then there's a surgeon who'll do surgery and well, that collaborative I mean, care uh, is critical and a, a part of what we d were trained in was functional medicine model and i Thank wanted to goodness. ask you if you, you, you absolutely because yeah, <laughs> that's the training i've done and the training Good. i'm continuing with Wonderful. And it just feels, I, I mean, wish it seems all nutritionists were. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, growing, mm. a growing area of mm -hmm. interest, but the link that I find so interesting is between that functional medicine and addiction. Yes. It's, there's, of it's sort of, un, it's extraordinary to me that people mm. don't, there isn't more people making mm -hmm. that connection. I agree. Because it's absolutely huge. Mm -hmm. It is. And it's, it's, essentially it's why it's I've critical. come here. This, this and a lot of people don't understand how critical nutrition is in treating addiction. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>